Hi, and welcome to The Slush Pile. I'm Kathleen Volkmiller, and I'm here to welcome you to our crazy podcast. Um, our podcast, sometimes when I talk to people about it, I say it's really just an editorial meeting with some jackassery, right? Absolutely. Uh, yes, that is what we're here for. Right. And our meetings always devolve into that at times, too. We we know how to um, have fun as we learn and as we discuss this work. So um, as we call through our generous submissions from our lovely authors, we decide what might make good fodder and we contact the authors and get their permission to do this. What this is about to be is an editorial meeting. Um, none of the talent today, none of the staff has read these poems ahead of time, except for, I think, me on this one. Oh, and Marion. But we just read it at a glance and said, yeah, let's do it. So um, we're here in the studio in Philadelphia and I do have to go to Ali first because I started this way. This is Ali Ziabash Tabari's last co-op yeah. session. Ooh. Yeah. So you're saying there's no cage fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this. Ali is still going to be in Philadelphia for about a year. He's still taking classes with me even next quarter. So um, I've already oh, told so him it's an open door policy to come sit in, but he will no longer be the co-op. So since he's no no longer a co-op, he will now be eligible for a cage fight. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, I think I'll sw I'll swing over to Brittany for a second because our next co-op is in the room. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Britt Ogilvy. She's here. She's against the wall like an actual fly. Seeing how this works, and um, on my left is a guy who's here almost always. My name is Tim Fitz, and I teach here at Drexel, and I'm the author of two sh collections of short stories, Hypothermia and Go Home and Cry for Yourselves. E to the ha. And we also have Zoe Heller. <laughs> They're enthusiastic, woo. She's in the publishing program and um, also still going to be around for a while. So hopefully we'll still hear and see her smile and face. Um, and up in New York. Hi, it's Jason. I am in my lovely office in lovely Tribeca. Hey. Hi. I miss everyone. Yeah. I feel bad about, I just, I just had my manifesto about, um, my anti-technology manifesto published. Um, so I, I feel guilty about being on all the technology. You love it. <laughs> I do. Well, uh, it's a glorious I'd rather time. be with you. Aww. I'd rather be with you. Um, but speaking of people I'd rather be with in person, Marion, Samantha, are you guys apart today? We are apart. We are yeah. Indeed. Take it. <laughs> So I am I'm curled up in my my little um, guest bedroom, curled up under a blanket because it's freezing here in Abu Dhabi. Um, it's not only chilly outside, it's cold inside. It's like air conditioning and chilly outside. Samantha, it's climate chaos. I have to say. What's chilly mean to yeah, you yeah, people? Well, yeah. What's chilly what mean in the about desert? Here? No. It was like 65 degrees this morning. So that's kind of chilly. <laughs> Give me a for break. Abu Dhabi. <laughs> My friend, I'll send you a screenshot of the temperature. <laughs> it's actually super cold uh, yesterday and today. I think today's high is, it's 25 right now, all right? Ooh. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. my. Okay, right. so just yeah, keep I it to yourself. Problem. And the real feel is 14. Ugh. It's it's bitter <laughs> some bitter bitter winds. I was um I was down in Northern Liberties and I came up on the train and the platforms uh it, the platform at Spring Garden you know is elevated and there's no way to stand inside and I was a little bit scared oh. for my life. <laughs> yeah, I was glad I didn't have an umbrella. It's windy out. It's, it's terrible. really windy. Yeah. Um, well, all right. But here in Abu Dhabi, people are walking around wearing blankets, right? Like it was it was chilly yesterday and everybody had their like parkas out, right? Um, because we're so unaccustomed to the chaos. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is Marion. I'm, I'm, you know, tucked in my little bedroom here over on Happiness Island, and I'm shouting love across the, the gulf there to Miss Samantha. Hi. Yes, hi, I'm Samantha, and I am about 20 minutes uh, two islands over from Marion. So hello from Abu Dhabi, chilly Abu Dhabi. 
<laughs> All right. Well, um, let's get rolling. We have uh, three poems today by Susanna Sheffer, and um, I'm really excited and uh, grateful that we have them and happy to read them. And uh, how about a volunteer? I volunteer Ollie. Okay. All well. right. Um, I'm a little sniffly, so. No, you're good today. <laughs> so after an introduction, home again, and it's as if the forest never happened. No one wants to hear about that great indifference or the lore of the witch house or what we had to do to save ourselves. I understand they won't talk about the hunger, the banishing, how easy it was to be rid of us. So I don't say anything about the forest inside of me, inside me. <clears throat> I don't tell them that trees grow behind my eyes at night or how I sometimes want to touch the bark because I learned to cherish its rough comfort. I'll do the remembering myself, letting it make of me what it will as memory does with its own moonlit trail, bread comes, peril, revelation. Thank nice. you. There's the thinking silence. <laughs> We're thinking nothing's wrong with your iPod. <laughs> Do people still use iPods? I feel like there's like a few years ago, there's like a bit of a hipster thing where people were taking old iPods and refurbishing them into oh. like MP4 players and stuff like that. Hmm. But I think that's the extent of it, right? Yeah. I, I think the iPod and the iPhone just kind of merged into mm. one entity. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. I don't know if anybody uses a, an iPod. Yeah, I don't. Um, so what are we thinking? So I remember finding this in the, the pile. Right. And, and snagging this bunch because I was really struck by the way it was telling you the story of Hansel and Gretel from a slightly like skewed stance. Um, and, and that caught my attention. Right. So uh, I like the notion of, you know, it, it's that part of the tale, right? Like the, they've, they've gone out into the woods, they've defeated the witch, and they come back to the, the house and, um, and now this is, you know, the re reflection on surviving that, right? So I kind of, I just dug it. I thought it was an interesting approach. You know, I, Marion, I love so much that we're so often the same brain. I remember <laughs> that I found this. <laughs> and then I sent it to you and said, these are pretty awesome, right? And you said, yeah, right, let's do it. That's so funny because maybe my brain was your brain for a minute because I could have sworn I found these and sent them to you. And then you confirmed them. Ah! <laughs> anyway, maybe maybe that's exactly what happened, Kathy. Maybe you sent them to me and I was like, oh, yeah, the pleasure of recognizing the, the underlying tale um, mm -hmm. is, is the thing that made me feel like I, I knew this poem, right? Yeah. And then not because it was a cliche or some re like representation of, Hansel and Gretel in a commonplace way, but enough weirdness in the telling it from the end of the story that I just thought was, it just had my attention. Yeah. I also like how it makes me think it's, it's the older of the siblings, whether it's Hansel or Gretel, because there feels like this protective nature to kind of the us of it um, when they're talking about, um, you know, to get rid of us or what we had to do to save ourselves. Um, I, I really dig it too. I'm with both of you or, or one of you, the one brain. <laughs> the one brain. We actually do have a, we're, let's not share it though. We do have a persona that is the collective of Marion and Kathleen, but we're not going to tell you. It's our own private and uh, in, interrelated being. Um, I'd like to also mention that I feel Certainly people have taken the Hansel and Gretel story and played with it, you know, again and again and again and again. And um, this this does it in a way that I still found fresh and intriguing and didn't make me go, oh, boy, the Hansel and Gretel story, you know, which I think could be a reaction. I remember finding this in the slush pile <laughs> <laughs> and thinking that I like that element of it, but equal parts just being tapped on fairy tales. And I think if there mm. wasn't so much of a fairy tale obsession these days or the past 10 years, 
that I would like it a lot more. And I can't help it <laughs> because I do feel like this is, it seems fresher than most of the retreads mm-hmm. out there. But you're still a little tired. Of I, it. I'm, a, I'm a, yeah, honestly, I'm a little tired of it, but I do, I, I can see why somebody would like it. Right. I'm just, you know, don't have as much of a resistance to the, to the bug, you know? Yeah. But I, I, I do I, like seeing those different, I, like if I cut out any reference, I would still kind of like this poem. Mm-hmm. You know? it's, it's physically painful for me to say this, but I agree with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, was, I was just at a reading, um, Anna Marie Hong was reading from her book H&G, which is like an entire book of um, retellings of Hansel and Gretel and like Captain Maris and like there's a whole anthology and Louise Flick. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I get, but I, I feel like this, you know, the gesture towards the trauma that survived and sort of the the desire of people not to speak of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it does feel familiar to me. And I, and I do think it's well done, but then I, I don't under, you know, the trees that grow behind my eyes at night and how I sometimes want to touch, touch the bark because I learned to cherish its rough comfort. Um, I don't know, how do you guys feel about that line? I, I mean, I don't, I, I was pondering about that as well. I don't particularly like that line, but um, but uh, I'm thinking that it's more like you know Hansel's um way of like uh, after getting back into the forest after escaping the the house of um the 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 witch that was going to eat them. Um, it's it, it's like his relief. I'm I'm getting that sense or uh. But I'm I'm not really fond. Like it doesn't really the the trees that grow behind my eyes. <laughs> it made me trip up a little bit when I was reading it as mm-hmm. well. Like I, I think it's, I think it's beautifully written, but I, but I do have this like sense of like it's a very familiar, and I, I don't know, if, and maybe I'm being unfair because I mean, or an Adam and Eve poem, or a um, Penelope and Odysseus poem, I would yeah. probably be more generous. So I don't know, like I, I don't know if it's like if I'm the problem, right? So okay, I think the. The Hansel and Gretel part of it for me too. Um, I, you know, I, I I can't remember why I did it, but I was looking back at the at the fairy tale and trying to get a sense of the original version, not the, like the Disney fied version. Um, and so that line about like the hunger and the banishing and how easy it was to be rid of us, like that is the premise for them being kicked in the woods. There's a a famine or a, you know something's going on that the parents think it's a good idea to be rid of the kids. Um, so that they can basically like fend for themselves, right? Against the hunger. And then the second part, the reference to the trees behind the eyes. Um, and then I sometimes want to touch the bark. I, is it Hansel or Gretel who's who's in in the cage feeding the witch like sticks, pretending that they're fingers, right? Well, it's, uh, Hansel is in the cage and he yeah. keeps holding out the stick so that, so that the witch thinks that he's not fat. And then right. Gretel is the one who tends the fire in the stove and ultimately pushes the witch in the um, stove. Right, 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 right. And so when the when the fairy tale ends after they 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 escape and get back to the house, the the it's the stepmother, right, whose idea it was in the first place, and then she's banished, as always, right, and the and the father accepts them back. So I kind of dig this like after colon and introduction being the the sense like this this making sense of the trauma of it is the starting place Mm -hmm. it's kind of cool i love those last lines i love the four last lines from i'll do the remembering myself letting it make of me what it will as memory does with its own moonlit trail breadcrumbs peril revelation shoot i love that (sighs) <sighs> we do have three by this poet. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. Shall we vote? Yeah. Okay. Sam, are you going to write Joe or Facebook message me? I'm going to vote on Zoom on Alrighty. our software. All righty. Fabulous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jason, which way are you going? <laughs> I'm holding my phone. I want, I want to know how many fingers I'm looking for from Joe. Did Jason put himself on mute? I, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm on. I voted. 
Oh, okay. I was asking which way. One person has. Because you better vote secret, right? We don't. We don't. Yeah, ever yeah. No, I was asking you which way because either it comes to Joe and he holds his oh, hands up. Or... Oh, I, I, I voted in Zoom. I voted All twice. Right. In perfect. Time. Perfect. One person has not voted. Okay, we're still waiting for one person. <laughs> the anticipation. And we're in the room, so let's do ours. Sure. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Vote. Mine's coming through Facebook. Yeah, it's in. So, hi, in case you hear a little bit of a pause, we had some technical difficulties, and uh, but we're back, and we're all here and ready to read the second poem by Susanna Sheffer. And um, um, Jason, you want to do it? Sure. Um, Hansel at his stepmother's grave. It's not as if I can't understand why you did it. I couldn't stand it either. The house so groaning and bent at the knees, the cupboards with their gaping mouths, our useless hands, and the demon in my belly, the reproach it put on my face. I would have ripped it out if I could have. So I understand why you said we had to go. Did you think we didn't hear you? Even then, we were good at lying still and listening to the sounds the night makes. Did you think even then we wouldn't try to find our way back to you? Nice. Thank you. I'm glad that we had that little conversation on the last poem to remind everybody of the um, original plot line. You know, well, I've also been reviewing the Brothers Grimm version of Hansel and Gretel. Uh -huh. through the magic of editing. Uh -huh. And um, it actually happens over a much longer period of time that like every time there's a famine, the stepmother tries to convince the father to get rid of them. And so like, there's like a year or more between, there's like at least one harvest season between each time that they go into the woods and all they have to do is get back home and the dad feels guilty enough that he won't do it again. But when there's a famine, then the stepmother is like, Gotta get rid of the kids. Right, right. Um, I I like that this is an address to the character that nobody remembers or thinks about, right? Even though she's the catalyst for it. Um, so saying that. Starting the convo with that. Hansel at his stepmother's grave. I mean, I I don't know. I, I mean, I'm having, I, I have a hard time with Hansel being empathetic here. Like, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's, it's mixed. It's a very complicated emotional landscape. I mean, it's, it's this kind of empathy mixed with this kind of anger. Um, but I, I feel like I want it to be like, I, I find him a little um, overly generous. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not talking about the poem. Though. I'm talking about like the, the character. My feelings about the fairy tale, I guess. If that's unfair, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I. I mean, I. I think he's still. He's letting his, his bitterness is in there too with those rhetorical questions. Did you think we didn't hear you? You know, he's saying we knew you were the one with this idea and banishing us. And that uh, to me, that last line is pretty poignant that even though she is the one uh, suggesting that they go or telling the dad, let, you know, banish them to the woods. Yeah. Did you think that even then we wouldn't try to find our way back to you? Sad. You know, poignant and not overkill for me. Yeah, I think I, I like the ambivalence of it. And I think that goes to Jason's critique, right? The fact that we've got Hansel at the grave site, right? Like that's, that's a way of finding your way back to the trauma too, right? The one thing that to like banish her from his mind entirely, right? Mm -hmm. After all surviving the trauma, but to actually go to the grave site, he's kind of performing this perpetual and, and God awful need, right? To be reconnected right did you did you think that even then we wouldn't try to find our way back to you as he's standing over her is intense yeah absolutely that image is pretty good pretty good
Yeah, I like that image. I love the idea of it. But my problem that I had on the other poem remains with with this. It's just being tired of the the fairy tales and wishing I could have gotten to this place in another way, in its own poem or it's in it. I mean, I, I do love that idea, how, especially if you have someone as cruel as the stepmother, how it still, be, she still becomes part of you and yeah. there's still a grieving yeah. process. And in the Grimm's version, like her death is just, um, I mean, it's, it's convenient. Right. When Han Hansel and Gretel get home by way of a magic duck, um, <laughs> their dad is like, yay, and your stepmother died. <laughs> like, <laughs> there, there's no, like, there's no comeuppance for her. Like, there's no, like, she's in no way, shape, or form punished. She's just dead. Oh, well, I well, you know, know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, yeah. I suppose that her not getting her poetic justice is why Hansel is so bitter in mm. in yeah. this piece, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, couldn't the death of itself, I mean, she banishes them so she has enough to eat or they don't have to worry about feeding them and then she dies. There's, yeah. you know, there, that's sort of a punishment, a karmic-like one. <clears throat> I feel like like one of the one of the most disturbing things that this sort of gets at in the story is that Hansel and Gretel <laughs> have to keep going back to people who are trying to kill them. Yeah. Right. right? That like yeah. the only way for Hansel and Gretel to not die yeah. is to return to the people who want them dead <laughs> and like won't admit it. And they hear them talking about it at night. And like I just I feel like I want that to kind of have more pressure on it. Like, like the first one, like I really get like the sort of the, and, and this is very characteristic of people who survive trauma, right? That like, like Absolutely. the amount that the person who survives wants to talk about it rarely matches the amount that people who didn't survive want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes in multiple directions, but, but typically that like people who want to talk about things are like, why will no one listen? Um, but in this one, I, I don't know. I wanted like, I mean, maybe, like, is it is it that I don't like Hansel's dignity? <laughs> he's, he was like, I mean, he's, he's so empathetic. But again, like, like the, the language is beautiful. I mean, the rhythms are perfect. It's not as if I can't understand what you do. I mean, the, the rhythms are just gorgeous. The prosody is spot on. Uh -huh. All of my quibbles are about fairy tales, and that just feels so unfair of me. But why is that? Un <laughs> why is that unfair that you're you're just tapped on that image? That whole you've just heard it too much. That's not unfair. That's absolutely well, realistic. But hang on a minute. It actually criticism. it does make me think about like the work that we're doing with literary magazines, right? Like the, the news of today's news, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's I, I take Jason's point, like the sort of you know. Um, abundance of fairy tale poems at the moment and the preoccupation with fairy tales makes these seem somehow less excellent than they are, but that's the context, not the text. So like a right. year from now, two years from now, if somebody scoops back into a PBQ and sees this poem, is it going to have, you know, the staying power? Maybe, right? Because the context will have shifted, right? Yeah. So, so. I understand people liking the poem because they like fairy tales also. I mean, I can see how it yeah. could have the opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if, if you're into it, you're into it. Mm -hmm. And if it's not worn out for you, then it's not worn out. For me, right. it's worn out. This one specifically, I would argue about the wearing out because of the point of view. To, yeah. to have Han uh, Hansel at stepmother's grave addressing her is, is I've never seen that point of view ever. So for me, that makes it fresh, even though it's treading a story we know, right? Um, I tell you what, I think I would really like what sort of, when I think about kids who are transitioning between the normal, the standard versions and in that space where adult fiction is not, where they're not really ready for it, the subject matter, these offer really interesting perspectives. Yeah. You know, I would, I think these would be great. I don't mean it in an insulting way in any way, but for like between fifth and seventh grade. I think well, kids yeah. would really, I, these would be fun to teach and these would be fun to read. 
Yeah. In that Personal side context. note, Tim is always searching for work for his daughters <laughs> that is more challenging than what is being fed to them, right? Yeah. But still age appropriate enough that it's, you know, not wrong to share with them. Yeah. So share these poems. Yes, I definitely Get back will. to us. Tell us what they, what they say. Um, are you guys ready to vote? Yeah. Sam, you are entirely quiet on this one. I know. I, I'm just thinking. I, I feel I'm a little... Um, uh, a little also fatigued from the um, fairy tale poems, but I'm trying to see how to separate that from reading this text. So uh-huh. that's where I'm at. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, shall we vote? We shall. All right. One, two, three, vote. I'm confused for a second. Hang on. Um, it's a tie. What? I don't wow. think this has ever happened on a podcast. Cage Son fight. of a bitch. What do we do? It's a tie. Um, wow. Wow. We have flies on the wall. Are all the thumbs in the room? Seriously. Are, is Brooke Everyone there? Does. You know how to throw a thumb, girl. We're asking our flies just to see what happens if we ask the flies. Don't don't ask her what she voted. <laughs> you should see these these women against the wall. Come on, Britt, throw a thumb. Throw a thumb. You were here. You were listening. Should we go with the flies? I don't know what to do. That's, that's a stumper. I can't believe we tied. That's so interesting. Wow. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have to figure this out. You want me to flip a coin? No, yeah, we flip no. no. Coin. Well, do, doesn't this mean we have to send it to another staff? Well, what's well, interesting, I- Jason, my friend, is that we have Abu Dhabi, New York, and Philadelphia all in the room. <laughs> so yeah, we could bring it to PBQ's editorial table. Uh, aren't we already meeting next Monday? Tiebreaker. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um. I believe so. Yeah. 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 Do you want us to do that? All right. We'll discuss. We'll figure it out. Sorry, Susanna, that we're not. Or sorry, audience. Sometimes things happen that are unexpected. So normally, I mean, we're kind of talking in code here. Uh, if if one of the city's staffs comes to an impasse, we send it to one of the other cities and let uh, and let them vote. Um, we also have something called the Klingon Council which is uh-huh. Mary and Jason and I. So we can, uh-huh. well, dress uh, that, that second poem in one of those two ways. And maybe by the time we post this podcast, uh, we'll be able to dress all of that on the page. But now, um, listeners, we're going to move on. All right? Or am I wrong, Marion? Marion? Yes, I'm here. Is I'm it here. okay to leave that hang in the air? Let's, let's let it hang in the air. Um, <laughs> well, and then... We'll decide what to do. Let's get to, let's look at her next. We're being honest that. about PBQ's process and this happened. Yeah. yeah. This, this is something that, I mean, it hasn't happened on a podcast, but this has happened before yeah. where sure. there's just not a clear decision and it has to be thrown to another staff or it has to come to the Klingon council. All right. It's okay. So then drama. moving on. What, Joe? It's high drama. High drama. <laughs> high drama today. <laughs> Hansel and Gretel in tension. Um, okay. We've got one more. Hansel prepares for the future. Um, I'll do it, or Sam, you can do it. I'll do it. All right. Okay. Hansel prepares for the future. Bread isn't good enough. He understands that now. It's too soft, too porous, too yielding, and he knows now that what is scattered at night can be gone by morning. Whenever he goes outside now, he keeps his eyes on the ground scanning for something so cunning and indelible that next time someone sends him away, he will have what he needs to resist the thieving world. Thank you. Oh, I, I find this poem so sad. Yeah. Like it goes, it goes to the, as Jason pointed out, like it wasn't just one time that they were banished. It was multiple times, right? And the first mm-hmm. time it's breadcrumbs, the second time it's pebbles and either way, right? They still, they still return to a place that, you know, banished them 
the first place, right? Like it's just the, and then that, that hopefulness at the end, right? That he believes he'll have what he needs to in the world is, you know, a little bit of a heartbreaker. Yeah. I think it's heartbreaking too, because they don't mention, or he doesn't mention the things, these things that would be cunning and that would be better than bread. Like he's still figuring it out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's scanning for it. Mm-hmm. I like cunning and indelible. Indelible. I just found it so awful that Hansel would like not have learned anything. Right. <laughs> like, well, he did. He learned that bread is not good enough. He learns that bread is not good enough. Uh no, he learns he learns always to have like a path back to the people who are gonna kill you. Yep. Yeah. That's oh, horrifying. I I like this title too. I think all three of them, the titles are, are terrific. Well, I think that, you know what, I'm reminded of, of what Tim was saying earlier um, about the poem sort of like fitting a certain, um, I don't know, like uh, cognitive or psychological development, right, for certain readers. And it just so happens I'm having my students read a couple chapters from Bruno Bettelheim, The Uses of Enchantment. Really? And the, the book is dated, but I love that book for its, its reading of fairy tales, right? Like mm-hmm. it's a psychoanalytic approach to reading fairy tales and recovering fairy tales as like the useful kind of social tools that they are because they create mm-hmm. that space in your head to, to figure out who you, who you would be in that narrative, right? Like h- how you come to an understanding of um, horrible treatment, right? And yeah. horrible, horrible people, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's why I'm, I'm, I, I am kind of drawn to the sort of, continuous preoccupation with fairy tales. I'm not sure what to make of it other than to notice it right now. I don't understand why Hansel, I just did. I don't understand why Hansel is like so drawn back to this. I mean, I guess it's all that he knows, right? But it just bothers me that, you know, in the second piece, he's like forgives his stepmother for being ruthless and evil and trying to have him and his sister killed. And then here he, he like, you know, like Jason said, he continues to follow this path back to the people that, you know, truly don't really care for him. Right. But like, like you just said, it is all he knows. And he is still a child, right? What is it? Where's he supposed to go? Yeah. I like that truth about this poem, that this is sometimes a pattern that we fall into. We could probably imagine several variations of this in our own lives. For me, that's interesting, but mm-hmm. I have like a like a missile defense shield against all things Hansel and Gretel that yeah. I can't that will not let me get anywhere beyond that. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Uh-huh. Anyway, but again, I like the approach for this. It's I kind of like when um, I I disagree with other positions in a way like this. I mean, if it's sort of refreshing um, to have things that I do enjoy about the poem, things that I like about it, but things that for me just don't resonate. Yeah. Um, So, you know, uh, listeners who are loyal, you know, and so does the editorial staff that I yell at Tim almost every episode. And because he always wants to look at the poems in the context of the other poems by the Mm -hmm. same author. And I always argue that they should stand alone. Right. So I hope you don't see me as a hypocrite when I do say that I will allow that kind of conversation to occur if something's already been accepted. Right. We're not because we're already saying yes to after an introduction. Now we know that we would have at least that and this uh, paired in a, in an issue. So thinking of it as a companion piece to after an introduction, and we don't know yet what's happening with um, the second poem. Does that in any way skew anybody's thoughts about the poem? About this, I mean, part of me is really torn because at the same time in classes, I'm trying to get students to understand that if you have a story 
we don't have one meaning. We have however many meanings are, are people in the class. So I love this idea of having people <clears throat> read these poems. To, and I think this process has to happen earlier in life than your freshman year in college. I don't know when it happens normally at school schools, but it seems to be this is the first time it's happening for most students. Yeah. And I feel like maybe fifth, sixth grade, you know, you got the tools of understanding the literal meaning and then getting them to examine things more carefully. And this, this, I love these poems in that context. Mm -hmm. So it's, but for me as a reader, that's a different thing. That's mm -hmm. what I got to go by mm -hmm. for this, for the, for my reaction. Sam, click lights are on you. You're too quiet I like, this episode. I like, yeah, I like the next time someone sends him away. I think for for me, this verse moves this poem outside of the fairy tale and um, makes me think of those times when we're trying to sit around, maybe uh, me with my girlfriends and figure out like why someone did something, why someone reacted some way. And like this idea of childhood trauma, pushing someone to push others away maybe, and all kind of the, the ripples in the pond that this verse speaks to me. So I really, I really like this poem. I find it sad and I find it to be just the start, honestly, of like his, his Hansel's life where he's going to be maybe pushing other people away in reaction to being pushed away himself. Yeah. And Kathy, I really take your point about like just imagining how these two would sit in an issue of PBQ, right? Or just the first poem alone or this the first poem plus another poem. So if we look at after an introduction, the one that we accepted, right? Mm -hmm. And then look, like imagine next to it, right? Council prepares for the future. I really like the the way the poet is is playing with almost like, you know, what did Andre Asman call that arbitrage? It's like the future past or like mm -hmm. past future, like the, the way those things are flipping here, right? We're at the end of the story, but it's the beginning for him, right? And then he's preparing for the future by, by, by trying to extricate himself from these memories that he can't, can't communicate about, right? And here he is trying to resist the thieving world. And I, and I keep coming back to that last line because thieving is such a surprise. It's a very, it's a very interesting adjective, right? Thieving. Um, thieving. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it's working, but it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like why would Hansel think of the world as, as being full of thieves? Or, well, maybe because it's stole from him. Uh, right. I think, uh, taking, I think is a general taking from him, right? Well, his yeah. only real experience, right, is with his father and stepmother right and his stepmother is like the stereotypical step uh, evil stepmother wants to get you know a better place for herself rather so he, she's stealing essentially his food and his yeah. love his and, and 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. affection yeah. it's been a lot of thinking on this episode <laughs> shall we yeah, let's go ahead. Sure. All right. Here we go. One, two, three, vote. And it's in. <laughs> there was dramatic tension this yeah, episode. Bit. I kind of <laughs> like that. So uh, we're we're two for three, with one being tabled for a minute or two. But we'll be sure to uh, let you guys know. Thank you so much, Susanna Sheffer, for sharing these, sending them to us in the first place, and then agreeing to be on the podcast. Um, so, anybody have anything else they want to say? I have a question for Jason. Jason, yeah. can you, what is the name of the, the, who is the poet and the book that you just mentioned that you went to? Oh, Anna Marie Hong um, wrote a book called H and G. Okay. And it's all about Hansel and Gretel. Got it. And it's like retellings of the story. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm. 
Cool. So I, I would mention the book um, Girls Coming Out of the Woods by Kashani Doshi. Um, I was lucky enough to see her perform last week. And I think the book was just nominated for a Hughes Prize, I think. Um, and it's it's tied directly into this wonderful creepiness of fairy tales and identity and, you know, um, the rage and the trauma that comes with culture. Terrific. So everybody can keep on... Keep on listening on and reading on and learning on. Dig it. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And thank you, Joe, as always.